So it's so important that an e-commerce brand aligns themselves with a, a really strong logistics partner. And that aspect is oftentimes overlooked at the end of the day. I want a good show, damn it. Great for a good show. It went awesome, yeah. I'm excited <laughs> to talk to you, Angie. Thank you for having yes. me. Yes. everyone and welcome to another episode of the ecom show i'm your host as usual andrew math and of course today i'm joined by the amazing jordan who is the founder of obi box jordan how you doing today ready for a good show very good and thank you so much andrew for having me yes yeah, super excited to have you on the show um i love to do the stereotypical thing and let you kind of kick us off tell us a little bit about you know your background and obviously more about obi box and we'll take it from there okay sounds good so um a little bit about me I spent, uh, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I currently live in Montreal, Quebec. Um, I am father of a uh, very quickly growing three-year-old. So, uh, <laughs> so added that to the entrepreneurial journey to become a dad throughout all that. Happily married. Um, worked 17 years in the corporate world and um, decided to launch my own business with, uh, first of all, we were uh, myself and a co-founder. And then we were joined by two other co-founders down the road. So today we're actually co four co-founders of, uh, of Obi Box. But yeah, six years ago, I left a, a well-paid corporate position with great benefits and uh, high salary and everything that you could dream for to jump out of the airplane on my own and build a parachute as I fell, which was called Obi Box. That's, uh, that is how it always is. And that is very, a very good way to explain how it feels. So tell us a little bit about Obi Box. Like it just, Pretend no one knows anything about it. What's the the process behind it? Who are you working with? What's the overall goal? Fantastic. So um, when I decided to start a business, I wanted to start a company in a sector that was really moving. And so me and uh, my initial co-founder, Paul, we, we sat down and we looked at various industries and we saw that the e-commerce sector was growing exponentially year over year. So on one side, you kind of had Amazon that was dominating the space. Uh, growing rapidly worldwide. And then you had everyone else. So you had uh, the Shopify stores, Magento stores, Wix. And um, now we said, okay, e-commerce is really growing, but where are the main pain points within that sector? And we kind of divided the e-com sector into three main components. So the first component is the whole online aspect. So uh, the stores, the marketing, the branding, the products that are sold, the descriptions that, that are linked to the products. So that's sort of the whole product side. The second step, once a purchase, once a product is purchased online, it's the fulfillment aspect. So once that purchase is product, it needs to be put in a box with a label and packaging and whatnot. And then the third step, that product needs to be shipped. So where we saw um, the biggest pain point within that flow was the last step. So we looked at la the last mile, last mile logistics side of e-com and realized there's a huge opportunity here. There's a lot of players that are kind of deconstructed, so we could probably have an opportunity to uh, to create a company that um, could offer a last mile logistics solution, and uh, that's what we did. Beautiful. So my background is very much in the e-commerce marketing side, and then when we get into like operations, inventory fulfillment, I am useless. So gonna ask you some rookie questions here. So I obviously the last mile side, essentially being literally what it is, which is the person who's basically dropping the package off at the, at the customer's uh, house or their apartment or something like that. Right. So explain to me once an order is placed, you know, comes out of someone's warehouse, are you taking it directly from the warehouse or you, is it going into, you know, a FedEx or UPS something like that? And then you're picking it up from there. Like, what does that process look like? And, and that's a really good question. So from a shopper's perspective, the last mile segment looks pretty simple, right? I mean, the parcel's put in a box and then it needs to get to your doorstep. Yeah. So it looks like it's pretty easy. But in actual fact, what we've realized after six years of trial and error is that there's 
six key stakeholders for a last mile logistics operation to work properly. So you have the shipper. So in order, you have the shipper, the middle mile carrier that picks up all of the parcels in bulk at the final point of packaging. So whether it be the uh, the shipper's location or maybe a third party logistics that's um, that's fulfilling the orders for the e-com merchant. So you have the shipper, the middle mile, sorting facilities, then the last mile partner, and then the recipient. And throughout all that, you need a system that can optimize routes, uh, can, can have a real-time key performance indicator tracking as well. So what we realized was we needed to create a technological ecosystem that basically linked those six key stakeholders together to make sure that everyone was properly served. Because at the end of the day, what the recipient wants to know, that online shopper wants to know what time the order is going to arrive at their place, uh, that it's delivered on the right day, the right time, and that the right instructions are followed uh, right up until the last step. And it's so important because uh, in, in e-commerce merchant that goes into that, that puts all sorts of energy and effort into uh, positioning their brand, uh, sourcing sustainable uh, elements to create their products. Then they put all sorts of effort into their packaging, maybe a, even a personalized note. Mm-hmm. And then afterwards, their shipping partner drops the ball and offers a horrible experience. That online shopper is not going to buy from that brand again. So it's so important that um, that a uh, an e-commerce brand al- aligns themselves with a, a really strong logistics partner, and that aspect is oftentimes overlooked at the end of the day. Yeah. How does that work for different types of packages? So obviously, you know, you've got stuff that's like massive and it's extreme, you know, they consider overweight or oversized. Then you've got stuff that's got to be in a cooler or, or kept at a certain temperature. Like how does that type of specialty boxing work? So we, we've kind of broken down the, the e-commerce industry into three main segments. And these are actually the three main segments that uh, OB Box has, has grown to be, uh, to be quite proficient in. So we deal with uh, business to business, um, B to C food. So you mentioned uh, you mentioned freshness, and I'll circle back on that in a second. And then um, B to C ecom. So that's the standard sporting goods, baby apparel, toys, essentially anything that you can buy online that's put in a flexi pack or in a box. Mm-hmm. But um, if I circle back to that second segment that I mentioned, the B to C food sector. It's a bit of an interesting segment because we all know of, of the meal kit companies that are out there. So they're ready to cook, ready to eat. I mean, without mentioning the names, but I mean, worldwide, that's also an industry that kind of popped up and followed the same trends of, of the e-com, uh, of the e-com sector. It just kept on growing exponentially, but ready to, ready to cook, ready to eat means that everything that's picked up today needs to be delivered tomorrow because otherwise the ice pack melts, the dry ice evaporates and um, and the product is lost. So we built our operational procedures and also our technological stack based on the needs of that particular industry. And within that particular industry, if you want to succeed, you have to offer a 99.5% success rate. Success rate means on time, in full, instructions followed. So that's where we started. So once we felt that we could satisfy the needs of, of that particular industry segment, then we kind of offered the same type of SLA to the uh, the uh, B2C e-com guys and the B2B guys as well. Beautiful. So let's go through that that overall process again, right? So you mentioned starting off the supplier, going through the middle mile, that kind of stuff. So at what point do you guys take over? And then is it up to who who's hiring you? Is it the e-commerce seller is hiring you? Is it the middle mile? Like what's what is that working like? We deal directly with the shippers. So essentially, we take that that whole sort of flow that I explained before, shipper, middle mile, sorting facility, last mile, and then recipient, and then that oversight layer. That And I call it an oversight layer. It actually is kind of the core of the engine. So it optimizes the routes and also offers real-time key performance indicators regarding where parcels are at and if they're on time and whatnot. We take charge of all of those different partners within our technological ecosystem. So we hook to the shippers. And then offer them essentially in a white glove Uber style delivery experience for all of their their e commerce uh, um, customers. Beautiful. So that information's fed back into whichever platform they're in. Let's just say like a Shopify, and that's yeah. essentially what keeps up to date all the tracking and where things are at and if it's been delivered and all that fun stuff. Exactly. Right. Beautiful. How did you come up with this? What were you doing before this? It, it was completely different, and maybe there's a bit of um, 
of self-reflection there of, of becoming less relevant. I was in a very traditional industry that hadn't changed in the past hundred years. It was in the world of industrial packaging. And I mean, that that's an industry that's very traditional, hasn't changed. And I was 35 years old at the time and I was just watching you know, the, the, the world, the world evolving really quickly. And my co-founder is a tech guy. And so mm-hmm. kind of back to the, the origin story, when I said we were looking at an industry that was really moving, we also wanted to, uh, to find an industry that had a problem that could be solved with technology. So we knew it had to be something that was growing quickly, where there were some major pain points, but also that they could be solved with technology. And, and again, maybe it's just me that wanted to make sure that I stay relevant and, and whatnot. So I wanted to kind of jump out of a traditional industry and, and jump into a, a, a tech focused uh, kind of cutting edge logistics, state of the art uh, sector. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a very interesting jump you took there. <laughs> I, I, I thought I knew <laughs> you don't know what you don't know. And uh, I, I thought I knew a lot more six years ago than I, I realized I don't know today. Uh, it's you and me both, man. <laughs> um, all right. So the one thing I do know as well is that you guys have been growing like a weed so you're not the only one out there. I know that. So what is, what if, without telling your competitors, obviously, who maybe are listening to the show, are, what, uh, like, what's, what's helping that? What's, what's fueling all that growth? Well, so, and that's an interesting question. And, and our competitors within our, our local spaces, they, they know who we are. So <laughs> I would say, um, it's, it's interesting because it almost comes down to the company's DNA. So I've been talking a lot about technology. And oftentimes what you'll see is when a company or when someone starts a transportation business, they'll start off in a more traditional way. So they'll start off buying a couple trucks, um, managing their customers through phone calls and Excel spreadsheets and whatnot. And then at some point, someone will come to them and say, hey, you need to offer a sexier tracking experience. So they'll go to a tech company that offers a tracking experience and then they'll kind of hook the tracking software into their flow. And then they'll realize, okay, we have so many drivers on the road. We need to build, we need to get an app that can manage the drivers. Mm-hmm. We need to get a routing system that can manage the routes. And so they'll end up creating an integration layer with all sorts of external SaaS products, but they're still a transportation company using software to fulfill the needs of the different stakeholders that I've been mentioning ever since before. But we started off saying, we're going to build our technology from scratch from ground up, it's going to be more expensive. It's going to be pretty difficult, but we're going to maintain 100% control over the user experience. And by user experience, it's not just the shipper's experience or the recipient's experience. It's also the driver's experience, the sorting facilities, the way that we manage sorting facilities, the way that we manage our middle mile carriers. So the fact that we control everyone's experience from A to Z, the fact that we can transfer the information of each individual parcel through each one of those platforms in real time gives us the ability to offer a, a way, again, sexier experience to all of those different end users that need to be uh, properly serviced within our technological ecosystem. So we are a tech company first and operations company second. Gotcha. Okay. So again, novice question. I apologize. The So let's say I'm a Shopify seller. And, you know, I'm trying to, you know, figure out fulfillment and how can I make sure that my customers get everything on time, that kind of stuff. Why would I go to you as opposed to dealing with like the FedExes, UPSs and all that fun stuff of the world? We're faster. We're very cost efficient. There you go. Uh, the transparency in terms of how we, or I should say the customer experience that we offer the online shopper. So if you receive a parcel through Obibox, you're actually going to have an Uber style experience. So you're going to be able to, to track the driver in real time, communicate with the driver to update delivery instructions. So cool. we've really built all of our different platforms based on real time, on real user feedback, because we kind of grew with our customers. So you really get, a, a, again, a, a white glove experience, but at scale, because we're using technology to offer it. And also what we've started pushing on really hard over the past, I'm going to say 18 months at this point, is um is reducing our carbon footprint so um within quebec we were one of the first companies to have electric vehicles on the road at the scale that we did so for a small business last year we purchased 21 electric vehicles and uh at this point now we've started to push our delivery partners towards electrifying their own vehicles and we're a little over 30 percent right now of our of our uh 
parcels are del- are delivered uh, in electric vehicles. So sustainability wow. as well is a strong component of our of our core values. Beautiful. How does that work from like a logistical standpoint of like don't the did electric cars like die after like half a day or do you, do they have to stop and charge them like what's that I'm just completely off topic but super curious. <laughs> no, and and that's a that's a really good question. And one of the reasons why we consider ourselves an asset-free company, so again, going back to those different stakeholders that I've been mentioning ever since before, it's basically all partners that we're, that we're managing within our technological ecosystem. But then I just mentioned that we own 21 electric vehicles. And mm-hmm. the reason why um, we purchased 21 electric vehicles, it's because we see the way that the industry is shifting. We see that uh, more and more consumers are allergic to greenwashing, so they don't want to just hear about what great initiatives companies are doing to try to reduce their carbon footprint. Yeah. They, they want to see tangible actions being taken. And so as we see the industry shifting towards um, more and more electric vehicles on the road, we realize that our routing software needs to be able to manage the constraints linked to managing a fleet of electric vehicles, which means managing the autonomy of the vehicles, managing uh, the, the, the charging stations, managing, uh, checking how weather affects autonomy, how does weight affect autonomy, the type of driver as well. So we said, what better way to understand specifically what constraints we need to hard code into our routing software to be able to better support our uh, our delivery partners down the road than to own a fleet of 21 electric vehicles and run them for 18 months. So yes, in the middle of winter, we had a couple drivers phone us up and say, hey, um, the, uh, the battery's dead. Can you, can I get a tow truck or can you come and boost me? Cause, and we kind of had to explain, well, that's not exactly how it works. So, uh, so yeah, we, we learned a ton over the past 18 months, uh, running, uh, electric vehicles. Interesting. Huh. That's pretty cool. What, um, the, the, the Uber thing is so interesting to me, right? Cause like as a, if I'm purchasing a package and I really want to know like, where is this thing? Like super excited for it to show up. So you're telling me the way that that technology works, it's just as if I were, you know, calling an Uber driver, I can kind of see where they're at and then obviously get some kind of notification of when it's been dropped off and that whole thing, correct? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we spent a lot of time deconstructing the the real last mile experience. So from the moment that the, so forget about all the other steps I was mentioning before, mm-hmm. middle mile and all that, from the moment that the parcel leaves the final sorting facility and is en route towards the online consumer or the online shopper, um, what type of information do we need to communicate at what step? So off the bat, um, and, and, and that's actually, it's, it's a bit of, it, it's kind of interesting because sometimes you overmanage your customers and create false expectations. And I'll explain if, if, if an online website promises delivery, let's say next day delivery between um, seven o'clock in the morning and five o'clock in the afternoon, and then when our truck leaves the warehouse, it gives them a 60 minute time window. So that parcel will be there between 11 and 12. And then there's a bit of a delay. And finally it shows up between 12 and one. And then all of a sudden the customer is unhappy because they say, oh, well, you said between 11 and 12, but the, the initial shipper had promised between, you know, seven o'clock in the morning and five o'clock at night. So it's kind of interesting that we have to reconcile our delivery promise with what the cust- with what the shipper is promising on their website. But ultimately, we offer 60 minute time delay time windows um, and then right up to the point where when the the uh, the customer is the next delivery, you can actually track your driver in real time. And like I said before, communicate with your driver, update delivery instructions, and then we manage the final 20 meters. And that's when the driver shows up in front of the house. There's a whole bunch of things that needs to happen for the experience to remain white glove, including following instructions. Um, walking up the driveway and not through the flower garden, making sure that the parcel is nice. well hidden, making sure that the proper pictures are taken, that the proper note is entered into the application. So uh, so we work really hard on making sure that each one of those steps are followed and audited as well. How does that work from a, a cost structure? Is there a, a recurring fee of some kind that's in place to leverage all the technology or is it kind of built into the shipping cost? Is there just shipping costs? Like what, what's that price structure look like? So from a shipper's perspective, we are offering a delivery service, a delivery service with all of the mm-hmm. components that I was explaining before. So yeah. we keep our costing pretty simple. Um, example, there's no, I mean, what we've seen in, in the industry, oftentimes there's a lot of hidden fees, uh, residential delivery. Uh, mm-hmm. Oh, you want a picture with that? It's an extra 75 cents or a dollar 50 or whatever. So us, it's, it's all pretty straightforward. It's here's your, here's your price per zone. 
Um, if your parcel is within this size range and our size ranges are pretty big, if it's within this size range, this is how much it's going to cost you. So it's straightforward. And that makes it easier also for the, the e-commerce uh, shipper to build their own cost structure and then use it as a marketing tool as well and say, okay, uh, if you purchase for over $99, it's free shipping. And they know that the cost that they're absorbing is a $7 straight and not going to be $9.50 at the end of the day because there were hidden costs. So yeah. we keep everything pretty straightforward. And the way that we manage um, internally, it's a little bit different because it, it is a, it's, it's a managed logistics fee. And so it's a little bit like Uber. So we have our top line revenue, then we pay all of our partners, then we have our net revenue. And that's what, that's what funds our, our R&D and our uh, technological development and also some of our operations as well. Beautiful. I love the cost structure because I know that that's the biggest, again, I'm on the marketing side, so very rarely have to deal with it, but I hear about it all the time, which is just yeah. shipping costs are just, uh, there's surprise stuff all the time. There's stuff you expect or stuff you don't expect and just stuff comes out of left field and it ends up completely ruining people's bottom line. So that's a, totally. that's a very commendable approach to take. And I'm sure a lot of people appreciate that. <laughs> It's, it's actually, and to go back to your question before, it's probably one of the reasons also why we're growing the way that we are. Yeah, I bet. Cause it makes it predictable. Sometimes I, I find that that to be one of the most interesting things is that you'll find these different businesses, whether they're apps or services or anything where they'll have relatively low cost, but then they nickel and dime you throughout it and becomes completely unnecessary. Then you have others where like, yeah, it costs a little bit higher, but at least it's predictable and you know what you're getting. So you're not like surprised one month or something like that. So I completely, I appreciate the, uh, the and, approach there. <laughs> and, and what I find, um, I, it's, it's, it's a, I find it a, a pretty horrible practice actually in the, the shipping industry, because what happens even for us when let's say we're pitching to a new customer and we present the pricing grid and then they say, oh, well, you guys are whatever, 20% higher than, than what I'm currently paying. And then we have to say, don't, don't look at your quote, look at your actual invoice. And then they come back to us and say, well, you guys are actually 25% lower. We say, yeah, because we're showing you the cost all in and you're not looking at the cost all in. So it's, it's really important to be comparing oranges with oranges when we're, we're at that level of discussion. But uh, it, it sometimes makes my job a little bit tougher though, for sure. I bet. Beautiful. Jordan, I really appreciate you having on the show. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know you're super busy, but I'd love to hear a lot uh, you know, where they can find out more about you, where they can find out more about Obibox, and uh, we'll wrap it up from there. All right? Absolutely. So uh, my personal LinkedIn is a good source of information. Uh, the Obibox LinkedIn is not too active right now, but will be become very active very soon. We do have a website, www.obibox.co. Um, you can write to anyone us, any one of us. So myself, uh, Michael, my my co-founder, Paul, my co-founder, and Francois, my other co-founder, our first name at obibox.co as well. And um, at this point, we have a, a pretty large team of, of uh, internal sales guys that can answer all your questions. And otherwise, I'm happy to do so. Perfect. Jordan, thank you so much for being on the show. Obviously, everyone who tuned in, thank you as well. Please make sure you do the usual and rate, review, subscribe, all that fun stuff, or head over to whichever podcast platform you prefer, or head over to ecomshow.com and check out all of our previous episodes. But as usual, thank you all for joining us, and I will see you all next time. Have a go. Thank you for tuning in to the Ecom Show. Head over to ecomshow.com to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or on the Blue Tusker YouTube channel. The Ecom Show is brought to you by Blue Tusker a full-service digital marketing company specifically for e-commerce sellers looking to accelerate their growth. Go to bluetusker.com now for more information. Make sure to tune in next week for another amazing episode of The Ecom Show.